PowerPoint. It has and disrupted all the stations, so we'll check it out later today. So Chris just left ES. He did a nice presentation there, so he is here to uh, speak to you guys about social media. And if you have any questions, please don't have to that. Thanks. Officer Jagger, do you need my computer? No. No, no. I'd like to have that problem. Uh, what time do I have you guys still? As long as it takes for you to drive home your points, are you? Okay, well, it's not going to take very long. And it would take a little bit longer. However, I, like John said, I don't have my PowerPoint um, presentation, unfortunately, for a, a whole bunch of circumstances. I have my controls for you. So I kind of winged it over at the uh, ES school that John referenced. I kind of have a better idea of how I want to go about it today. But this being a small audience and me not having my stuff, I want to make this a little interactive. So I, John and I are kind of doing this on the fly because, like he said, the name is Michelle Corby. She's not here to actually speak with you. And for what it's worth, it's a shame that she did decide to drop the F-bomb in front of the six-year-old kid because she has a very compelling story to tell because she was kind of down and out in a lot of ways and has really worked herself um, into a very successful business person. So I always think, and I have been to some of John's movement program, a message from somebody who has made terrible mistakes on their front end is, is very illustrative of how you can, you know, put the time in, put the work in, uh, and, and get to a good place. But more importantly, it's illustrative also if you make a, a terrible decision or terrible decisions, all the consequences and the costs that they can have to you guys. So it's more of a tale of what not to do and how it can affect you if you decide to do it, which is a good segue into social media. So again, I'm going to try to make this as interactive as possible. Who has uh, at least one social media account in the room? And again, I'm not, I was no fan of audience participation, so if you guys don't raise your hands, I'm okay with it. All right, so the people that did raise their hand, though, you have one, who has more than one? Okay, more than two, more than three, more than four. Okay, I'll stop at four. So back in the day, as you guys can remember, at least historically, there was really only one game in town when Facebook kicked off, and that's what started social media back in 2003. You either had Facebook or you didn't have social media, right? So back in the day, as soon as social media, specifically Facebook, came on the scene, there were problems right away. What are some of the problems you guys can think of that would have came on the scene with social media, Facebook specifically? I'll answer my own question. So the problem is pretty obvious, right? So the problem is, or was and still is, is harassment, bullying, all that crap, right? So somebody would either, and it wasn't so, so sophisticated on the front end, it would be their profile and they would just be saying nasty, mean-spirited you know, things about somebody else, whether it was about their race, whether it was about um, you know, religion, whether it was about the way they dress, it could be about their weight, it could be about anything, it was just nasty stuff. So, of course, right away, back in 2003, they came to the police and they said, or called us to their house and said, either I'm being harassed through Facebook or my son or my daughter's being harassed through Facebook. And of course, when they made that complaint, they would have the computer, they would print the stuff, and they would show us the evidence. What do you think back in 2003, 2004, our solution was? Delete it. So, Right. Now, those answers are, are you know come together perfectly. It's true. We, that was the first shot was delete it, and the the, the uh, that was our, our response to it. And our reason was because the thinking rather was exactly what you said because it's just nonsense, right? Especially as an adult who didn't have Facebook, you're coming in here basically presenting a problem which would be easily solved if you got rid of it. So not myself, but every cop. John included, whenever we would you know, go to people's houses, they would come in the police department, that was our solution. And a lot of guys just said they didn't write reports. It was so simple, like get rid of it, knock it off, you know, let it go, it was no big deal. So obviously, as we all know, and the reason we thought that is back in 2003, we thought this was just a fad. This was just a passing fancy, it was the flavor of the day, it was gonna come and go, people were obsessed with it, they were fascinated with it, but it would just be like reality TV. It would just have its moment in the sun, and then it would kind of peter out something else to take its place. Unfortunately, it didn't go that way, and we all know that because now we have Twitter, we have Instagram, we have uh, Snapchat, we have um, all kinds of Vine and Tumblr and YouTube and all kinds of social media things that are out there. So when I asked about raising hands as far as who has one, who has two, who has three, it is so common nowadays to have multiple social media accounts, right? People have Twitter. If you have probably Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat, almost everybody has it. Facebook is, is as much as I thought it was kind of getting old. For an older generation, if you look it up and see what the most popular uh, social media sites are today, Facebook, by far and away, outnumbers everything else. So either you guys aren't using them, people are. Facebook is still very, very popular. But we know with the younger generation, our audience is usually Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Having said that, there's really not a lot of difference between them if you want to accomplish your objective of bullying somebody, harassing somebody, or saying nasty, mean-spirited things, right? They all can be misused just as easily. So the conversation and the point that I'm here to make is, first of all, 
the best way to make a point would just be if you treated people like you wanted to treat yourself, you wanted to be treated rather, if you treated people decently, I, that's all I have to say, I walk out of the room. Obviously, that's just not that easy, right? I don't mean for you, I just mean for people in general. There's, you know, guys, you're very young, there's impulsivity, right? There's some immaturity issues, and again, I don't mean this audience, I just mean kids in general, right? So there's the, you have a very dangerous device in your hand or in front of you with, again, those issues that are <coughs> overarching your uh, your communication style. So as much as right now we're in a very controlled environment, we're sitting in class, you know, you guys are listening, we're talking, right now it makes perfect sense, it's very easy to control what you want to do as far as communication. But when you're in the moment and something has happened or somebody just said something to you and the temptation or the opportunity to respond is, is there, that's where the opportunity to misuse this is, is obviously going to present itself. The consequences that misusing social media and instant communication are it can be devastating. Um, for what it's worth, I, I you know, talked about this at the ES, it is, it is counterintuitive, meaning it is against kind of common sense, as well as very unfair, the way people judge people nowadays. Um, we all know and recognize, this goes back to against common sense, we all know and recognize straight away that most of the things that people say on social media or through text, instant communication text messages, and when you look at them afterward, you know that they didn't take the time to sit down and think about it before they wrote it, tweeted it, said it, whatever, right? We know it's impulsive. We know that perhaps, you know, especially with some, uh, some <coughs> older people, in other words, some young adults, there's substance abuse in the way, whether they're under the influence of drugs or whether, more appropriately, they're under the influence of alcohol, not exactly to an extreme degree, but again, there's emotion, sometimes substance abuse, so we know there's some things that may have led them to tweet, to say that, to text it, whatever. Having said all that, is that open? No. Okay. Having said all that, there's absolutely no forgiveness. So if you guys, and this is the way it is, you just got to get used to it. So if you guys want to apply for a job, if you want to date a prospective partner, if you want to go to a college, of course, all these entities are going to research your social media us usage and they're going to see what you say, what you think, what you believe. And when they do that, they, they are going to not read into, but there's going to be absolutely zero forgiveness for something that you post. Zero forgiveness. If you're dressed a certain way, displaying some type of a shirt, or holding a certain thing, whether it's drug paraphernalia, or what's alcohol containers, or you, you make a specific comment, they are not going to forgive you. And one comment, you know, it's, it's always that, that old adage, you know, a uh, hundred people can tell you look great, one person tells you you look crappy, what do you think you're going to think about? The thing that most people are going to think about that yeah, you look crappy. So that's the way people look at it. So they could see you as a fine candidate for, again, college, a relationship, a job. They see all the social media. You could be Boy Scout, outstanding person, you know, just a wonderful, nice kid. You say one stupid thing, and they're going to say, that's what he's all about, and you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. The easiest thing to do is not have it, but it's very unrealistic. And, it, and to some degree, I guess, as far as socialization, it's unhealthy if it's used appropriately and not, uh, moderately to have social media. So how do we avoid the pitfalls? Okay. So Nelson and I, again, John said Nelson's not here, came up with kind of some strategies to encourage you guys to avoid the missteps. And believing the missteps can be very, very severe. They can have legal consequences, but more importantly, they can have life consequences. Again, prohibiting you guys from having opportunities you would otherwise have. Who is this guy, sir? I have just another question. Sure. Like, I, I've never gotten a clear answer on this. So if you have a social media account, like a Twitter, that's through some sort of obvious or something, and it's not connected to your name in any way, would they still see that? Like, do they have a way of finding that that's you? Yeah. Well, the police do. Like, let's say. Well, I know police yeah. do, but I'm talking about the college or job prospects. Potentially, I'll tell you how. Okay, so let's say, obviously, as you go forward in life, you know, you, whether it's you know, you have a relationship that goes south, or you have people that don't really care for you, but they know about this other account, this alias account, and you do get into college, you do get the job, you do get wherever you want to be. There's sometimes this happens. It's happened in the police department. More, or, or oftentimes, when, whenever it's a job or college or whatever, there's some type of a probationary aspect to your employment. So you might get the job because you hit all that crap and you're doing, living life and things are fine and somebody comes and says, hey, I just want to let you know that you know he's got this other account and this is what it is. And now they're onto it, you could lose your job, lose your opportunity, or now they're going to look at you and say, okay, number one, the guy's a liar because he didn't tell us about this, and number two, look what he's all about. So we're going to start to look for reasons to move on or it's going to not give you opportunities for promotions or those types of things. So again, the alias account kind of thing isn't really a smart thing to do. And John, you know, uh, tells an aspect of uh, a story, just kind of hit the point home. We had a, a very, uh, very, uh, what's the word I'm searching for? Promising recruit. When I say recruit, I mean somebody that was in the process to get hired. She was a female. She did very, very well, looked very sharp, very squared away, presented very well. 
But part of our hiring process, and not unlike a lot of companies outside of law enforcement, is to say to you, we want you to either sit side by side with us and open up all your social media accounts and let us look through them, um, or give us the passwords and we're going to do it on our own. If you say, I'm not doing that, I don't think that's fair, then there's the door. And that's just the way it works. So this girl, I'm like, uh, just like a lot of people who think, okay, well, I'll have my cake and eat it too. I'll, I'll let them log on and all of a sudden you look and the creation date for the social media account was three or four months ago. Well, what do you think happened? Of course, the person got wise because there's a lot of people out there, whether it's guidance counselors or recruiters that say, don't use social media inappropriately. So the person went, again, they want to have a cake and eat too. Well, I'll use it inappropriately, but then I'll, I'll hide it and I'll create a new one. And then that one will be like the virtual one, right? The real clean one. But the other one, just like you said, kind of an alias thing. So we said to the girl, there's absolutely no way. You just started using social media four months ago. So let's see the real deal. Now she's in a spot, so it's either well, roll the dice and show them, or just walk out the door and say, I don't know what you're talking about, I never had social media. So she rolled the dice and didn't come out her way because she used it inappropriately. So she cost herself everything. Now, I don't know what she's doing today, but I know she's not working here and she very much wanted to. Um, for what it's worth, people talk. When I say people, I mean when you apply to a place, not just police departments, and you strike out, a lot of the employers are going to say, tell us everywhere you've applied. And, and when you list those out, they're going to say, why didn't you get these jobs? And you're going to have to come up with an answer. And if you, whether your answer, you're going to give your answer, what do you think your employer's going to do? You're going to call those people and say, why didn't you hire them? So you can't hide it. It becomes harder and harder to hide it because now you're developing a history of not getting these jobs for these reasons. And all of a sudden, you're, like, you're blacklisted. You're unhirable. You know? it, 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 it's, and again, I agree. There's a lot of unfairness in this. There is a lot of unfairness. Because I guarantee you, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, and we had this stuff in our hands, we'd be doing the same stupid stuff ourselves because we're immature and impulsive, you know? But the stakes are never as high as they are for you guys. I mean, we have, again, it is very, very unfortunate, but there's no fixing it. There's nothing nothing at all that you can do about it. Who in this room even knows what they want to do as an adult? Dermatology. Dermatology? Okay, anyone want to go to the military? Okay, who wants to go to college? Okay, how about work in a trade? Okay, so it's good to see that everybody has an idea, you know, even if it's just kind of a, an idea, not necessarily a plan on what they want to do. So the idea is, especially when you're close to the end of the race, meaning you're your junior and senior year in high school, that's when the stakes are at their highest, right? Because now the idea turns into a plan. If you want to be successful, the plan is going to be, you know, again, good the SATs, uh, applying places, having a very good college resume so you present well because it's a competitive environment out there and it, when you get out to the real world you're going to find out how competitive it is and all the things that are unique to you and what makes you you sad as it is you are just a number and people don't want a headache in this day and age so that's why employers go through all the trouble to figure out who you are and if, if they don't like you because of something that you present in your history and in your social media stuff they're going to move on they will absolutely move on they will not do the, the fair thing would be to call you and ask you to explain. They're not going to do it. They have too many, too much. You know, they have a need and they don't have the time. There's better people out there. They're going to move on. There's absolutely no forgiveness. That's the way it is. It's the way it is. Not only is it's the way it's going to continue to be. It's only going to get worse. So you have to use this responsibly. You really have to use it responsibly. <clears throat> My part of the, the portion of the presentation, I also tell a story about Monet Davis. Who here is familiar with Monet Davis? Right. Okay. Uh, back in 2015, remember she was a member of the Taney Dragons Little League Baseball team? She went to the Little League World Series. Sound familiar to anybody? No? Not at all? Okay. Well, it's not that old. Usually, it's, it's the first class I've had where, again, maybe it's an audience participation thing, but it's the first class I've had where some, everyone said, you know, that I'm not uh, familiar with her. But, where it's worth, she was a 15, 16 year old girl. She was a black female from South Philadelphia, and she played for a uh, Little, uh, Little League Baseball team called the Taney Dragons. So, for those of you who are not familiar with Little League Baseball, Obviously, it's a male-dominated sport. So much so that the league baseball has been around since the, you know, the 40s. However, it wasn't until the 1970s that they changed the chart and the girls were allowed to participate. So having said that, from the early 1970s all the way to 2015, <clears throat> I think there were only 17 or 18 girls that actually made a team that made it to the League World Series. And when I say series, I mean the tournament to play in the actual championship team. Of those girls, she was the sixth person to ever get a hit, and she was the first female to ever pitch a shutout. So it was obviously a lot of accomplishments for this young lady, and she was very, uh, very wholesome, wonderful person. Just a great, feel-good, role model person, right? So she had her moment in the sun, which was, you know, was, you know, lasted for a very long time because of who she was, and obviously everyone just was so captivated with her success, so much so that she actually made the cover of Sports Illustrated. Change of, change of glass. Oh, okay. 
So she makes the cover of Sports Illustrated. She actually graces the cover of the Philadelphia Inquirer sports page, I think, or maybe the, the cover of the cover itself. For six days in a row, it was she made the talk show circuit. I mean, she was an icon, right? Very, very, you know, as far as celebrities are concerned, very famous, given she was just a kid on the baseball team. So after all that kind of happened, and she was still, her name was very noteworthy, um, she's just living her life, you know, and I'm sure very happy with where she was. She ends up, her, her Little League Baseball series in that year, career ended, when she ended up playing a team from Nevada. She gave up a couple runs, and they ended up losing in the round of the tournament. However, she still had a hell of a, a, a run, and a lot of accomplishments, and everyone was really in love with this girl. So there's another part of the story, um, and the other guy, the guy involved, is a guy by the name of Joey Castleberry. Seeing as nobody's heard of Monet Davis, which is, you know, uh, speaks a lot, uh, no one, I guarantee you, has heard of Joey Castleberry, and there's no reason you should have. Joey Castleberry was just a guy. He's just one of us, meaning me, you, everybody in the room, all, all your moms, your dads, just a guy. Nobody would otherwise hear of outside of their social or family circle, a guy living his life. This guy went to a, a high school called Nefactin, which is in Montgomery County, and it's very similar as far as his demographics to Pensbury. So he could have easily just been a Pensbury kid, right? So he goes to high school, local high school, just a normal guy, plays baseball, like whether or not there's any anybody plays for Pensbury or plays uh, sports in this room, just a guy playing on a high school team. He did very well, he was very uh, blessed as far as his athletic abilities, and he actually set several records which still to this day exist in the back room. So he goes to Bloomsburg University, which I'm sure some, are all not, some if not all of you are familiar with Bloomsburg. Bloomsburg is one of the 14 state schools in Pennsylvania, it's a good school, it's about two and a half hours away. So he's going to Bloomsburg, and he's playing for the Bloomsburg baseball team. I don't know what division they are, but it's a good team, and it's, you know, it's again, it's one of those things where, depending on where he wants to go in life, who knows what awaited him, whether a professional career would manifest itself through the draft. But he's doing really well at Bloomsburg. He's a junior in college, and he's batting 396. And for those of you who are baseball fans, that's pretty good. Okay, three home runs for the season, he's a starting first baseman. So Joey's over here doing his thing, Monet's over here doing her thing. They have nothing in common, they don't know each other whatsoever. So Disney decides that they're going to try to capitalize on the whole Monet feel-good thing, and they're going to make a movie about her, which sounds like a good idea, right? It's a feel-good story. Young girl playing baseball, there's a lot of good moving parts there, and I think a lot of people uh, thought the idea was, was wonderful. So, of course, because it's Disney, owned by ABC, it becomes newsworthy, right? So they get the word out there. Disney's you know, going to make a movie about Monet Davis. So Joey Castleberry, much like everybody else in the world who pays attention to the news, became aware that Disney was going to make this movie. So who has Twitter in the room? Okay. What can you do with Twitter what, when you comment what's it called? Well, tweet is what you do when you when you talk. What's, when you take something that somebody else wrote and, and post it, what's that called? Retweet. Okay, so Joey Castleberry hears about Twitter. I'm sorry, he hears about uh, Monet Davis, and this is what his tweet is. Disney is making a Monet Davis, a movie about Monet Davis. What a joke. That slut got rocked by Nevada. Now, for what it's worth, that's what he tweeted. I guarantee you that's not the worst thing that anybody in this room has heard not, uh, not only not heard in their life, probably not the worst thing they've heard today, right? It's stupid. It's just a nonsensical, stupid thing, a comment, the answer to a question nobody asked them. And that's the problem with social media. Somehow it gives people a platform to put their opinion out there or their stupid observation on things that nobody cares about. And that's the danger of it. So that's what he wrote. That's what he wrote. You know, Monet Davis, I can't believe what a joke they're making a movie about. Now, I guarantee you this much. If this happened 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Monet Davis, Joey Castro, all that crap, he opens the newspaper or comes into the room and it's on the, uh, the nightly news that ABC's making a movie or Disney's making a movie. I guarantee you, because the thought was there, he would have had the same impulse, but what would he have done? He would have, you know, said it to the people around him, he would have been the cafeteria table, the water cooler, the locker room, he would have said that, and whoever his, his audience was, the four or five people around him, or they got his buddy, they would have either chuckled, shrugged, not responded, whatever, and would have been out of the system done and over with, right? Who cares? It's stupid. So unfortunately, though, we're in a different world. So he tweets that, so, and that's it. He doesn't tweet another, you know, multiple things, maybe it's one stupid tweet. So one of his friends, again, I don't know what their motivation was, probably because they thought, ah, it's obnoxious, it's stupid, it's funny, they retweeted it. So then it gets retweeted by somebody else. And now, as you guys know with <coughs> social media and Twitter, the, you know, when you put it on out there, the further it gets away from you. Like now you're, people have it, they don't even know who the hell they are. You don't know where they are, it's just going. Now it becomes viral, we're all familiar with the concept of viral. It's out of control, right? So now, because of what he wrote, if you think back to the words, they accuse him of being racist, and they accuse him of being sexist and misogynist. So now, he's getting death threats. His family's getting death threats. People found out where he lives, like it's out of control. It's so much so that within 24 hours, 24 hours, he has to shut the whole thing down. He is done. He has to get rid of his Twitter, Twitter account. So before he goes out the door, because this is so out of control, he decides to put a very well-written apology, which I would have had if I had my slide with me, and it's very well done. So much so, 
that I, I believe that he probably had an attorney or family member or family members look at it and kind of tweak it, and make sure it's, it's exactly what he wanted to say. But what he did say was, and this, this apology was that how it was a foolish and impulsive thing that he did, and this is an example of how you know 140 characters, which is the limit for Twitter, can um, you know ruin someone's reputation or life. He's he's very impressed by Monet. She was quite an inspiration. He's sorry for everything he said and he did, and then he gets rid of the account. So because this story again goes viral. Now the Twitter, uh, his Twitter account and that tweet had absolutely no reference to Bloomsburg University. The only reason you would know he went to Bloomsburg is if you knew him. That's it. He doesn't say, as, as a Bloomsburg University student, I think. So there's no connection there. There's no relationship. So having said that, you would think that Bloomsburg shouldn't take any, you know, I would say exception, but they should have absolutely no control or consequences for him. What do you think the Bloomsburg did? They kicked him off, well, close. They didn't kick him out of the college, but they kicked him off the team, which was a hell of a lot worse, I'm sure, for him than being kicked out of school. So he's off the baseball team. All the baseball team. This is making national news, and you guys can look it up and see it yourself. But, you know, pundits and news journalists and sports people from the East Coast to West Coast were talking about this. It was a very, very hot topic, okay? And they were all debating on Twitter, the tweet, him, uh, whether or not she could kick off the team. So, of course, it makes it to Monet Davis and her coach. So she comes, you know, public with this, and her... Uh, her feeling, and this goes to show who she was as a person and how you know, good-hearted she was, she forgives him, of course, and she and her coach reached out to Bloomsburg U University and asked for him to be reinstated. I think her quote I have in my presentation was, you know, he hurt me, but he hurts more. I know what it takes to, to, to get to where he was. Um, I'm sure he, you know, he said he was sorry. I'm sure he didn't mean it. Why not give him a second chance? And what she meant was, and those, again, if you guys play athletics, uh, you know, organized sports, there is so much work. You know, when you watch uh, it's so easy to criticize professional athletes when they have a poor game, you know, but it, it's just the way it is, right? But their sport, it's not a nine to five, right? There's so much that goes into it, and historically, their whole life has been driven to that. The conditioning, the training, the practice, the weights, everything in between to get them to that game day performance. And their careers are so short. Her being an athlete and him being an athlete, he spent years of his life, not to mention, I'm sure he loved what he did to get to the point he was for this stupid tweet. So she reaches out and says, give him a second chance. It's, it's, I forgive him. It's not a big deal. You think he got a second chance? No. Okay, and, but not for me. All that build up on the front end, it, it would be natural to say, yeah, he got a second chance. Now, for what it's worth, historically in America, this is the land, or was, the land of second chances. This was the land of reinvention. This was the land where people loved, and if you follow sitcoms and movies, especially back in the day, people in America love the story about the guy who screws up or who starts off, you know, and reinvents himself, works his way back up. It's that rocky, that feel-good story where you just become that guy and everyone rallies around you. It doesn't work like that anymore. You say one stupid thing like that and you're done. And next thing you know, people don't even want to associate with you. That's how bad it is with social media. And again, who the hell would have thought that this stupid thing he wrote would have those consequences? I'm sure he's still shaking his head thinking, how the hell did this happen? Now, does it happen to everybody? No. Is the potential there? Absolutely. It's, it's, those mistakes were mistakes. They're not yours, you know what I mean? But they can cost you so much. As you guys, and guys and girls who, who um, you know, either are dating or want to date someone, especially at your age, or when you become parents yourself, I guarantee you, if your parents are concerned about who you are dating or who you want to date, they're going to look them up. They're going to do the same thing you do to each other, right? And if they see something that they don't like or going forward when you see something that you don't like, you're not going to allow your son or daughter to have contact with somebody because you can see what they're all about. It'll cost you relationships. It'll cost you reputation. We talked about, you know, his situation. His situation can be your situation. <clears throat> Again, I don't have it with me, but every time I give the presentation, what I do is this, too. There's, you know, people say it all the time, and there's a, this, this illustrates the truth of it, that when something is on the Internet, it's on there forever. If you Google... You can do this when you go home. If you Google Joey Castleberry, it's all you have to do. And it's a unique name, but not, he's not the only one in America, not the only one in the United States that ever existed. If you Google him in this day, you know, two, three years removed, all the page fills up with all the stuff, all the links, all the articles from the whole Monday Davis. So going forward, the rest of his life, that's what this guy's going to be known for. That is what this, this, that, that's going to be his, uh, this reputation, you know, so if he wants to apply for a job, you know, if he marries and has a kid, this is who this guy is, all for that one stupid tweet. And it cost him, didn't it cost him enough for that tweet? I mean, I think it did. And again, everybody who's anybody, you know, who reads the story or, or sees what he said, look, everybody has to admit that, but not for social media. He would have said it to his audience, like, he didn't care, he didn't have a stake in this, he didn't, he wasn't going to get a petition and go drive to Disney's headquarters and, you know, protest like this is wrong. It was a stupid passing observation. It was a stupid, impulsive thought. That's just how dangerous this whole thing can be, you know? 
so the whole joy get Castleberry thing is what's you know kind of uh, falls into a category of something called a cautionary tale. A cautionary tale is this. Okay, a cautionary tale is when somebody, uh, a story about somebody, something happens to because of what they did and the outcome. Simple point, but if you pay attention to society, and essentially all, everything that's newsworthy falls into a couple different categories, right? Sports, politics, religion, education, entertainment, you know, the kind of, you know, national, uh, local, and regional news. So that's kind of everything that comes in. If you are interested in any of those, and I guarantee everybody in the room has an interest, whether it's sports, or entertainment, news, politics, whatever, sometimes multiple ones, right? Every single of those genres, every single one of those little categories has stories, or is full of stories, on a regular basis of people who have screwed up through social media. Those of you who pay attention to the most recent uh, political uh, election we had, presidential election, as well as the state side and, and other national races, it was, and this is going to be the gold standard going forward, right? Everything that either one of those or the other candidates said was totally scrutinized with social media. Everything still is. That's how bad it is. Everything you write. And again, those people who have a team of handlers around them, who have people helping them craft what they want to write, are still taken to task for everything they said and what they meant by when they said it. It is the same with you guys. It is no different. There's no forgiveness for them. There's no uh, uh, you know, understanding for them. There will be no understanding for you. That's why it's so important that you guys use this stuff responsibly. Now, for what it's worth, that cautionary tale it was Joey Castleberry's, you know, I told you the story, but it was my story to tell. What I encourage you to do, to avoid this crap, is pay attention to what goes on so you don't have to make the same mistake somebody else to learn their lesson. If you pay attention to somebody else, and, you know, again, some of these stories are interesting, of course, the story that they tell about people screwing up, things they said, all that crap, if you pay attention to it, you can say, well, if that was me, or when I, that is me, or when I have that opportunity, it's not going to happen to me because I see what it costs them, I'm not going to do that. You just need to do that to remind yourselves. Otherwise, if you don't, you're going to make the same mistakes they will, they did, and you're going to have the same consequences. Now, speaking of consequences, so like I told you back in the day, 2003, when this Facebook thing kicked off, and we used to tell people to get rid of the accounts, delete all that crap. Okay, we've come a long way as far as police as well as the government and how we address these things. The legislature has crafted legislation crimes specific to social media usage. So there's now sexting laws, there's revenge pornography laws, and there's laws about cyber harassment, cyber bullying. We meaning John, I, the rest of the police department, it's not just here, it's all over the United States of America. And of course, these things all the time. We are down in the office, as well as after hours, when parents come in, kids come in, all that kind of crap, all the time for people that don't heed the warning. And we arrest people. You'll find yourself in juvenile court, you'll find yourself in district court, you'll find yourself getting consequences for something you've easily avoided. And if you want to communicate anonymously, there's ways, believe me, there's ways, it's not that hard for us to do the work we have to do to get, you know, peel back those layers to get to the truth of the matter and find out who's doing what to know. And believe me, when you do things in an anonymous manner, the punishment and the opinion of you is a lot worse because it's a lot more calculated. It's one thing if you have an opinion as wrong as it is or as obnoxious or offensive as it is, but you're saying it like I'm standing here, this is my picture, these are my words, you know what I mean? At least you have the guts and plain English to say it. There's still shouldn't, there's a problem there, we're gonna hold you accountable, but when you go so far out of your way to create some anonymous or more than one anonymous profiles and to harass, bully, comment, say terrible mean spirit things about somebody, you know, obviously everybody's gonna form a very strong and appropriate opinion about you and what appropriate punishment you gave. A course of conduct is all it takes. And a course of conduct means two times. So if you say something negative about somebody once, you get the benefit of the doubt, knock it off, don't do it again. Two times you're getting arrested. You know, that's that's the reality of it. One of the other things that we can do with, with, uh, with some of the crimes involving cell phones is something called forfeiture. And we do this all the time. And those of you, hopefully, no one in the room has this happened to, but we get called down to the office because someone has an intimate image, meaning a sexual sexual a picture of somebody either with no clothes on or in a, in a sexual pose, and they send it to somebody else. Next thing you know, it's getting passed around. Everyone gets come down to the office. They get their phones. They sort it all out. They get organized. They call us. We go down there. We take everyone's phones. We take the phones back to the police department, and you know, obviously we examine the evidence, follow it, get an opinion, make an arrest. Sometimes we don't make an arrest, but you know what? We don't get the phones back. It's one of the things that we can do where sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's case by case, but that's one of the, the opportunities we have to the law is they forfeit their phone. Those of you guys who have, and I'm sure everyone has this have a cell phone here, most of not all of you have through your parents' plan. If you cancel the contracts, why the hell would your parents want to pay for a phone that no one's using? What does the phone company want? 
for money for the phone. They want the phone or the money, right. And the phones are very, very expensive, right? So of course parents don't understand all this crap, right? They don't know forfeiture, they don't know stuff. They just think it's, you know, whatever, it's gonna work out. So they come, we want our son or daughter's phone back. We're not getting it back. It's forfeited, we're keeping it. So now they gotta buy a phone that they don't want to have any longer and buy a second phone for their kid to use, assuming they even have any interest in that. It's a very expensive endeavor, okay? That's just some of the legal consequences. But, you know, cycling back to the beginning, you know, just consequences, and I told you just what you put out there on social media and how people can find out who you are and what you say have the consequences they have. However, get arrested, have a criminal history, and just try to work with that outside of all stuff in the highly competitive uh, you know, environment that we have. Yes, sir? Why don't you just back here reset the phones? Punishment. That's the whole idea of forfeiture, yeah. So we can't do that again. We have done that sometimes case to case. It all comes down into, you know, the, as much as there's a lot of black and white with the law, there's also a lot of gray, where even if a crime occurred, not all, every crime, not every defendant is, is, is equal, right? So certainly there are people that are more sympathetic, there are situations that are more sympathetic, and then there are ones that are a lot more aggravating. And the aggravating ones, that's the whole thing. We want to get as much bang for our buck as possible so the punishment just keeps on going. But yes, we have some factory reset. And that's the thing, too, that I, when we said yes. So, Let's say um, you know somebody has a photo a photograph of somebody that they should not have got because somebody shouldn't have sent it in the first place. But nevertheless, they have it, and they start sending it to people. Even if those people didn't solicit it, once it all starts going in the direction it goes, and they all come down to the office, and they start examining the phones, and they see all the people that it was sent to, those people come down, and then their phones get taken. And once they have everything rounded up, that's when they call us. We don't have to give that. Even if you didn't ask for it and you got it, that's enough. Like. So be very careful of who you, you know, that's who you give your phone number to, but tell your friends don't send me anything stupid because when it all comes out, it comes out, and next thing you know, you may lose your phone just because you were having a relationship to a knucklehead. Jared Pinners? Yeah, um, so what happened if someone sent you, I thought you deleted it. Are you still going to come for that? Well, again, it's a case by case. But would you be called down? Would you be part of the case? Would you be part of the investigation? Yeah. Would you be inconvenienced? Because until we sort it out, sometimes it takes time, and believe me, it's so telling <clears throat> how much people, uh, it's how, how, necessary phones are because when we have these cases I gotta tell you you know whoever's case is his voicemail is full the next day when he comes in because every parent is calling when am I get my son's phone back when am I get my daughter's phone back so sometimes it takes us a couple days a couple weeks to sort through it so if you unfortunately you got it you didn't want it you deleted it well you know we can always you know examine the phone situation and pull it back but I think a mercy would be shown to you but now you're caught up in this and you don't have your phone for however long it takes us to figure it out you know it's just a, it's a stupid place to be any other questions so again, you know, I really like to think that the, the legal consequences to this are not the part of the message that really should change your behavior. The, the, the kind of the, the, the trinity of this should be treat people decently because that's how you want to be treated, right? That should be the, if I could just say that and walk out, that should be what guides your behavior. But secondary to that is I have a, a, a future ahead of me. I have a plan in place. I know where I want to be, who I want to be, and where I want to be. I don't want anything to get in my way. That's next. And the last rung on the ladder is the legal consequences. I don't want to get in trouble, I don't want to lose my phone, I don't want to get arrested, I don't want to go to court, I don't want my parents to grab, whatever the case may be, right? So if all three need to come together to change your behavior or to kind of, you know, in, in, encourage you to do certain things, then that it is what it is. But, you know, I like to think that it doesn't come down to number three. One and two should take care of, of your, your decision making. But just be mindful, you know, for as much as there's so many things we do in life, especially when we're young, that is impulsive and immature and expected, predictable, right? We get the benefit of the doubt a lot, right? Our parents give us the benefit of the doubt because they know we're young and impulsive and mature, right? That's part of growing. That's why you go from immature to mature. You get the benefit of the doubt all the time. You get trust, you know, you break trust, you gain trust, all that crap, right? With this stuff, even at the tender age of 17, 18, 19, it may happen. You're done. You're just a number. People will move on. They will form an opinion, and the opinion will last forever. I think, you know, aside from being a dead horse, that's my point. Does anyone have any questions? Sir. What would you suggest if a kid had some sketchy material up there that he or she already posted? Um, what would be your advice for that person? If you did have something up there that's, and again, if you had something up there that you put in either in light of today's conversation or in light of just good common sense and maybe rereading what you wrote or posted, Take it down, get rid of it, delete it, and obviously learn from the mistake and don't do it again. You know, as time and distance heals all things, right? So going back to the employer, the relationship, the, the college thing, if you say something devastatingly stupid, okay, and enough time and distance has come, uh, has, 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 has passed from it, you will get mercy, you will get some forgiveness. However, if it's a regular theme, 
you know, that's what we know you're all about. Now, is that, that one stupid thing that you said went going to come back and haunt you? Maybe. It all depends on your audience. By the same token, if you did put something out, get rid of it, delete it, so that it doesn't get retweeted, repost, screenshot, all that crap. Get rid of it, you know, and don't do it again. Learn from your own mistake. Else, guys? Um, I don't know Facebook. I don't know a lot of people do, but say if I deleted it and I started a new one just so I can have like a fresh start and have like nothing else for it, so, like there still be a chance of like anything showing up even if I deleted it. It kind of goes back to the question he said before. So, like, if you deleted it today, how old are you? Okay, you deleted it today, and you started a new one, and it was clean, and whatever, whatever. And it's not until three years later that you sit down with an employer, and they say, let me see your social media account. I think three years of that account would be enough where they wouldn't need. You come in, and it's six months, or two months, or four months, and clearly, you decided to finally, you know, get your head out of your ass, and have a clean account and an employer is going to say uh, time out here like there's just not enough time and distance let's see what you've been doing on your other one for the last years they still make may make you bring up your old one or ask you to or like I said in that story a friend of yours or you know not really a friend an enemy of yours may say hey just so you know you know and that does happen believe it you know people who want to get you have an agenda they will reach out and say you know we get calls all the time from people that are applying and say hey I used to date so and so and you know he's going to come in and tell you this but he has this other account or has these other accounts and they're not working there anymore. Well, I don't know how Facebook works. So if if if, if they you know if it's absolutely inaccessible, that's one thing. But if you just have them logged on, or they can tell you like you know reopen the account, whatever, then, then they would give us access that way. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm just. That's probably a smart smart play there. Okay. Else, guys. Else? So quick thing, I'd like to say, how many of you guys said you're interested in the military? So, um, for you guys that are interested in going into the military, I run the police academy here at Falls in the summertime. Um, in fact, Mr. Goya will be part of it this year. He's going to do my use of force, help with use of force um, component. But if you're interested in the military, I run the police academy here in the summer. It's eligible for kids who are going into 9th through 12th in this year's graduates. Uh, my first year we had 53 kids come. Out of the 53, 52 graduated last year, we had 67 come. 62 graduated, 5 quit. So uh, it is an age-appropriate police academy. This year I'm going to have five cops that are drill instructors, and they are going, they do nothing but uh, absolutely yell at you. Um, just like any basic training is, just like any police academy is, or fire academy. Um, I bring in guest speakers from all different uh, backgrounds of law enforcement. I have somebody here from New Jersey State Police, Pennsylvania State Police, FBI, Homeland Security, Immigration, Custom Enforcement. I'm trying to get the district attorney to come down, the public defender. I'll have a judge here. Um, we do all kinds of good things. Uh, there's some classroom, um, 50 minutes, every every hour is 50 minutes in a classroom. When you're in a classroom, um, the phones are off. There's no IEPs in my program because there are no IEPs in the real world once you get out of high school. Everybody is held accountable. It is very discipline oriented. It is very structured. Um, I will issue you a uniform that you'll wear. It's a couple of t-shirts, baseball hat, pair of shorts. I'll give you a pen, a water bottle, a drawstring backpack, paper, and a folder. Um, you'll be required to take notes in the classroom because at the very last day, what I do is I give everybody a written test, and the written test is based on the instructors that come in. They give me five um, questions for a test that they're going to touch on in their presentation. The reason I do that is not to grade you out, pass or fail. It is to grade out the instructors that come in because if, if everybody in the class were to get all five questions wrong, then I'm not going to bring that person back because it would be foolish because that person wasted your time. Um, we do mock traffic stops. I will take you to a crime scene um, that we will create. Actually, Chris creates the crime scene. Um, somebody is giving us a house again to um, do this thing. Uh, my oldest guys and girls, that, um, kids, that the kids that are going into 12th grade or kids that have graduated, graduated this year, I will take the Cooper Trauma Center in Camden. They do an awesome prevention piece. I have the Army recruiters. Um, you remember back, uh, Sergeant Turner was in here. I heard those uh, recruiters will be on the track with us. We do PT every day for about two hours. Um, hopefully this year nobody's going to suffer heat exhaustion. I have some more medical people that will be there. The first year we ran it, we had to take two kids to the hospital for heat exhaustion. Last year we had to take five. So this year we're going to treat it a little differently. If you're not sweating, you're not going to be running on the track. You have to sit on the side. Um, but I don't ask you to do anything on the track. 
that I will not do. I believe leaders lead from the front, and I, and I and all the drill instructors that are out on the track with you will do everything that we ask you for. The only cost for this is $20. The reason I charge you $20 is because the last day I go to McCaffrey's, and Jim McCaffrey, who runs the business for his dad, used to be a police officer here in Falls. He gives me a discount, and I, I buy a huge hot meal for everybody to have that last day. Um, I also then, there's enough food that any instructor that wants to come back can eat, and then what I do is I give what's left over to the custodial staff of the school. Because without the men and women who work here and help me with uh, my needs, the program would never work. So, it is, uh, that's the only cost involved. Uh, it is from July 12th to July 27th. It's a Wednesday, Thursday, Monday through Thursday, Monday through Thursday. We have the graduation here at Pennsbury High School East, and uh, Mr. Mahoney has filmed it the first two years. He may be filming it again this year. But, uh, if he's not, he'll edit what we do film and put together the graduation ceremony. If you go on YouTube and you type in Falls Township Police and you click on my shoulder patch, you'll be able to see the first two years of graduations that are on there and see how the kids come in. And that's how they look. Um, your families, you invite your families to it so your families and friends can come and watch the graduation. If you have a family member who's in the military, who is in law enforcement, uh, fire safety, or EMS, if that person is uh, in active duty, I would like them to wear their uniform. They can come and be part of our ceremony. They will sit on stage, and when your name is called and you come up onto the stage, that family member will hand you your diploma, and then you'll go down and, and uh, salute me and shake my hand and, and a couple of other people and back to your seat. So I would encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested in the military or uh, law enforcement. Also, if you go on Facebook and you look up Falls Township Police Youth Police Academy, I have thousands of pictures of the kids up there um, because we take pictures so family members can see it. Four things to get into my program. You have to come to school. You have to come to school. You can't be late to school all the time. I understand once in a while people are, are late. I get that. But you can't be consistently late. You have to try your best here in school. If your best is a D plus or a C, I'm fine with that. As long as that teacher, or guidance counselor, or administrator tells me that that's your best and you're trying. And most importantly, you cannot be a disciplinary problem. I don't take any jack offs in this program. None. And if you don't buy into it when you're there, I kick you out, simply because I'm not charging you anything. You can keep the clothes I give you because I'll advertise for me. The other thing I do have is a mandatory parent guardian meeting. That will be sometime in June. I'll set two dates. And uh, your parent or guardian must come in and listen to my curriculum. They have to listen to me, and I'm going to talk about um, all the things that we're going to be doing. I'll also have a person there this year, Marty McLaughlin, who's going to uh, be on Extreme Fitness. He's going to be there for two afternoons on the track for about three hours. He's going to talk about the importance of hydration, nutrition, rest. So um, that is a program I run. I want to throw it out there if any of you are interested. You can get applications online at Falls Township Police. Uh, if not, I can give something to Scogin and show how to get this for you. Any questions on that? Awesome. I want to thank you guys very much for your attention to Scogin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.